uh, I want to invite our panelists, uh, Gail and Carey, who is the Vice President of Government uh, Affairs Relations for the National Association of Evangelicals, privileged to labor with him. Uh, Hannah uh, Orozco, Refugee and Immigration Policy and Advocacy Manager with Bethany Christian Services. Uh, Chelsea Patterson Sobolik, Director of Public Policy, Ethics and Religion, Religious Liberties Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, Matthew Sorens, who will serve as the moderator, serves as the U.S. Director of Church Mobilization and Advocacy for World Relief and the National Coordinator of the EIT. So welcome aboard, and I turn things over to you, Matt. Thank you so much, Walter. We are so grateful um, for your, your leadership here and glad to have Hannah and Galen and Chelsea with us. Um, Galen, I think I'll start with you. Um, you know, the NAE, as, as Walter has already alluded, has been advocating on immigration issues for a really long time. You and I have been together on Capitol Hill many times over a decade or longer, and we've seen a lot of bills fail. <laughs> and, you know, it's been um, years of maybe passes through one chamber of Cong Congress, but not the other. Um, not to start on a pessimistic note, but it, in the current politicized political climate, is anything possible this year in terms of immigration policy changes? Well, thanks, Matt. As as you might uh, know, uh, if you get your news mostly from certain parts of the internet, you might think that about the only thing members of Congress do is stand and yell at each other. Uh, but in fact, there's there are a lot of bipartisan conversations going on behind the scenes, and we've seen some results to show for that. Over the past couple of years, we saw several uh, COVID relief bills pass with overwhelming support and more recently the bipartisan immigration bill I, i'm sorry infrastructure bill as a that's a freudian slip um the the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh passed uh with very strong support um and we've seen also uh, almost unanimous support for a number of initiatives to help the people of ukraine uh, during the crisis that they're facing. Uh, so yes, uh, I think uh, it is possible th for things to happen. And, and our conviction is that we'd like to see them happen this year. Uh, if you look at the polls, you find that um, large, large numbers, uh, around four out of five Americans, support several um, sort of low-hanging fruit in the immigration policy space, uh, legal and permanent status and citizenship for dreamers uh, and other uh, temporary protected status uh, long-term uh, recipients. Uh, also for um, doing, doing things that help our farm workers and our, our farm uh, workforce. Uh, and then of course, uh, having uh, measures that address security vulnerabilities at the border. Uh, so we think that a package that combines those three things uh, would have a pretty good um, chance of winning a majority support in, in the Congress. And uh, then there's a whole coalition that's recently come together called the Alliance for New Immigration Consensus uh, that is working on these exact things. Uh, brings together not only uh, many of our uh, faith groups in the evangelical world and, and more broadly, but also business and agriculture and national security and educational groups uh, spanning a political spectrum, some pretty far to the left, others pretty far to the right, a lot of others in the middle. Uh, so we think we have a, a good coalition uh, to get something across the finish line. But I think the key issue, Matt, is the intensity of the advocacy. Uh, because you, four out of five Americans support these things, but a lot of them don't care that deeply about it. And what I think is if the 250 or so people that are on this call uh, were to take this as a high priority, uh, you all would speak for thousands, many thousands of people, and your voice would be amplified. And very likely we would see some concrete relief that would help um, the people that we've heard on, on our call this, and many uh, millions of others as well. Uh, thank you so much, Galen. I'm hoping and praying that, that you're right there. Um, Beth, um, I'm sorry, Hannah, I'm going to turn to you. Um, Bethany Christian Services, where you work, is probably best known for your focus on children, including um, you're one of a number of organizations that works um, to care for unaccompanied children when they're 
identified at the at the U.S. Mexican border. Now that issue has been in the news a lot in the last year on I think unprecedented numbers of, of children in that category, more than 100,000, 120,000. Can you remind us, you know, as succinctly as possible for a very complicated legal framework, what does the law say around what happens to those children and, and how does Bethany care for them? What are some of the policy issues at play as we think about these unaccompanied children? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so unaccompanied children, they're fleeing their home countries seeking safety. And often these thousands of children are, are reduced to numbers. We're thinking about the, the number of children coming, right? But the world and their countries are unstable and they're seeking safety and reconnection with their families. The majority of UC that we see coming across the Southwest border uh, into the United States is often from the Northern Triangle in Central America. So Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, but various other countries as well. And the UC system as we see it, it's designed to function this way. So these youth from Central America don't have access to apply for documentation, get refugee status while in country of origin and come here legally. The UC system, as we know it, it is the legal way. The laws here in the US are designed for youth to get onto US soil and make their claim for why they're seeking safety. And this allows access to due process, to make their claim in front of a judge. And it is actually illegal for them to leave the United States before a judge makes a decision on their case. But this process takes time. And rather than detain children for prolonged periods of time, this reunification process was designed to assure that children are released to family, that decreases rates of prolonged family separation, and really support that family in the process to pursue legal status for that child. So here at Bethany and many other faith-based agencies, we really believe that every child, regardless of where they are born, deserves to be shown the love of Jesus, safety and dignity, love and family. And we enter this space to care for vulnerable children and ensure that their needs are met with quality services until we can reunify them with their the, the people that can care for them even better, their families. Thank you so much. It's, it's really helpful, Hannah. Um, I'm going to turn then to you, Chelsea, and um, talk about another group of immigrants who arrived as kids, but uh, distinct from the people who are arriving more recently. These are people who, uh, in this case, has often been in the United States for 10, 20, or 30 years. So they're, in most cases, now adults. And this would be people like Jose, uh, who, Pastor Jose, who we heard from, um, who are sometimes called dreamers, and some benefit from the DACA program. Um, I know that uh, many of us have been trying to follow the ups and downs in the courts around the DACA program, and that's something that ERLC, along with our other evangelical congregation table leadership organizations, have seen as a really high priority, um, especially the most recent decision, as I understand it, is a, a decision from a judge in Texas that could put at risk the roughly 650,000 uh, dreamers who currently are residing lawfully and working lawfully with DACA. Can you give us a reminder of sort of the state of play for the situation and, and what the ERLC and other evangelical groups are advocating for there? Sure thing. Uh, so first, um, before we, we dive into that, I think it's uh, really important. Um, I want to echo what Jose uh, said. It's important for us to remember that dreamers are not an abstraction. <laughs> they're people who are created in God's image. Um, they're people who are brought here as children by their parents, and their entire lives and livelihoods are at stake right now. Um, the ERLC, along with the Evangelical Immigration Table, has long called on Congress to provide a permanent solution for DREAMers um, because we believe that this is a justice issue, um, that the Bible is clear that we do not hold children responsible for the actions of their parents. Um, so I will provide a quick overview of what DACA is, a very, very brief uh, history, and then kind of current state of play and what we're asking for right now. So DACA stands for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And it's a policy that was implemented by the Obama administration in 2012 that allows uh, undocumented immigrants who are brought into the US as children to stay in the country. Uh, DACA's aim um, is temporarily shielding DACA recipients from deportation and providing them work authorization with possible renewal every year. Um, until recently, it was every two years. Um, so in 2020, the Supreme Court ruled that an effort by the Trump administration to terminate the, the DACA program um, had not followed the proper procedures. 
Um, and then in 2021, uh, U.S. District uh, Judge Hainan ruled that the, the DACA uh, program is illegal. Um, so the Biden administration has appealed this case to the Fifth Circuit, and there's a chance that this case could reach uh, the Supreme Court. There's also a chance that the, the Fifth Circuit and or the Supreme Court uh, could affirm Judge Hainan's decision and end the DACA program, leaving hundreds of thousands of dreamers unable to work lawfully and provide for their families. Our vulnerable neighbors are not adequately uh, protected. And Southern Baptists, um, along with, with many, many uh, Christians, have long advocated um, for immigration reforms, uh, particularly to protect this special category of, of men and women. Um, so because of the extreme uncertainty from the courts, um, we certainly feel a, a strong sense of urgency and we are uh, hoping to help Congress feel that strong sense of urgency to pass a permanent um, permanent bipartisan legislation that will immediately protect our DACA, DACA uh, neighbors. Um, it's also important to, to know that most Americans agree uh, that, that Congress should immediately protect our DACA neighbors. Um, you know, there's not a lot that that we can seem to agree on these days, but most Americans do agree um, that we that Congress should swiftly act and protect our, our DACA neighbors. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. I'm gonna actually stay with you, Chelsea. Uh, it's another question related to um, vulnerable foreign-born individuals who are now adults, but who came here as US children, and that's those who may have been adopted internationally as children. There's a, a bill in Congress that I know you've worked on even before your current role at the RLC for many years called the Adoptee Citizenship Act. I wonder if you could tell me what that is and, and why it's an important priority and kind of where it stands. Sure thing. So prior to the year 2000, um, any international adoptee was not automatically a U.S. citizen. They had to go through kind of a long, arduous process um, to be naturalized. And there's actually um, a Senate staffer who had adopted um several children from Eastern Europe, um, realized what a cumbersome process this was, worked on a bill called the Child Citizenship Act that was passed, extraordinarily bipartisanly signed into law by President Clinton, um, that set, uh, going forward, any international adoptee, once their adoption was uh, lawful, uh, or, uh, legalized, uh, their adoption, or they would have full US citizenship, which is great, uh, but it, uh, left out a population who was 18 or older at the time the bill was signed. So if an adoptee was 18 or older in the year 2000, they were excluded from the Child Citizenship Act. So all the Adoptee Citizenship Act uh, seeks to do is go back and close that loophole and grant that population their citizenship that they should have had all along. Um, Matt, like you mentioned, I uh, used to work on Capitol Hill and I worked on this bill when I was uh, on the Hill. Uh, but for the first time, this important uh, piece of legislation passed the, the U.S. House of Representatives as an amendment to the Compete Act, Competes Act, uh, which is the House's version of the uh, China Competition Bill. The Senate has passed their version, and uh, we are hoping they will go to uh, what's known as conference committee soon, and that uh, this really important provision will be included in uh, the final China uh, package. Yeah, well, we are hoping and praying that that is the case. Thank you for your ongoing advocacy for that community, Chelsea. Um, Hannah, I'm going to turn to you then. Uh, and this actually comes in part a question from someone named Carol, who submitted a question. And as a reminder, you can submit questions. We won't get to all of them, but we will get to as many as we can. Um, Carol asked basically what the status is of Afghans. And I know that Bethany, Christian Services like World Relief, has been involved in resettling a large number of Afghans in the past eight months. But as we already heard from, from Walter, most of the Afghans were not technically resettled as refugees. And in general, that means they, they aren't all going to have a clear path to permanent legal status. So that, that's something actually the leadership of the Evangelical Immigration Table addressed in a letter to Congress back in September, but it's still not resolved. So I know that one of the efforts to resolve this is something called the Afghan Adjustment Act. Can you tell me what that is and, and where it stands? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for your question, Carol. And I think I saw the comment on there it, that it feels like um, Afghans have been brought here to the U.S. and kind of forgotten about in terms of their status and access. 
Um, and so exactly, right? So we have some folks from Afghanistan who've been uh, evacuated and relocated here to the U.S. and currently have the status of parole, which grants their right to live and work here in the U.S., um, but provides no direct path to permanent residence or U.S. citizenship. Um, and that permanent residence gives immigrants the assurance to invest their lives and livelihood and careers here in their new country. So the Afghan Adjustment Act would do just that. It would create a pathway for uh, certain Afghans to apply for permanent status after one year of being paroled here in the country. Uh, and like I said, in order to ensure that folks have access to uh, protections and status and are not uh, living their lives in short increments without knowing what their future holds, it's really helpful and needed for um, that access. Uh, and really the current system for special immigrant visa or asylum is just incredibly backlogged. And so it would be a prolonged process for these Afghans that have been evacuated. Um, we do know that the administration recently granted access to temporary protected status for Afghan parolees, which is good. It's an acknowledgement that access to protections and status is needed. But again, that status isn't permanent, which means we have Afghan parolees that live their lives in these 18 month increments and not really knowing what their future might hold. And again, um, you know, limiting their, their interest or ability to really invest in their communities. Um, so the Afghan Adjustment Act, uh, we are um, within the uh, Evangelical Immigration Table, we're advocating for that within other organizations as well. Um, it has not yet been introduced in Congress, and we hope to see some progress here in the coming weeks. Uh, and inv invite you to join us in advocacy for this legislation um, using some of the resources that have already been previously shared here too. Thank you so, so much, Hannah. Um, I think maybe I'll open this up to any of you. Um, you know, in addition to Af the Afghan crisis, uh, there's a lot of evangelicals who are very concerned, uh, understandably, about Ukrainians who've had to flee their country just in the last month, um, as well as about longer standing refugee crisis, people who've had to flee Syria or Burma or the Democratic Republic of Congo and various other conflicts um, over many years who remain in tenuous, uncertain conditions. And um, I, I'll maybe open this up to everyone wants to jump in, but I'm curious how both the US government could do a better job of rebuilding the refugee resettlement program, and then also how, how our churches can be a part of responding both here in the United States and, and globally. Well, I'm happy to, to uh, talk about that. Um, the first thing is that if we want to admit refugees, we need to have enough staff in uh, the relevant government agencies that interview and process and, and vet all of the, uh, the applicants. Uh, we don't have that at present. Uh, so that's why there is very long uh, backlogs in processing of uh, refugees. And so in the meantime, ref refugees are living in often very dangerous circumstances. Um, many times they don't have work authorization. And so there's a lot can be done uh, to, to speed up without sacrificing uh, any security concerns, speed up the processing so that um, if, if we're going to say no at the end of the day, people should know that so they can look at other options. But if we are going to say yes, let's say yes now, not 10 years from now, when uh, the situation for that family will have, they've been, been through a lot of needless suffering. Uh, for those who are churches in the U.S., uh, certainly there's so many opportunities to welcome people, uh, if everything from meeting them when they first arrive, helping them with housing, all the practical things that people need, uh, helping them find jobs, uh, befriending them. Um, inviting them to uh, a picnic, all, all the things that Americans do, especially when the weather's nice, um, include uh, immigrants and refugees, especially recent arrivals in, in your plans. And it's a, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, it's a cross-cultural opportunity. And for uh, Christians, it's also an opportunity to share the love of Christ. Yeah, and I can just jump in uh, with, with two quick things, one on a policy uh, front and then one on how Southern Baptist churches are serving refugees. So today, uh, President Biden uh, released his FY23 budget proposal. And it's worth noting, this is just a blueprint. It will likely get changed. 
um, quite a bit, but uh, there was uh, significant funding for uh, investing in the rebuilding of the refugee resettlement program here in the United States. Um, and we have long called, we actually just sent a letter to the administration uh, recently calling for the administration to, um, to invest and to properly uh, uh, fund um, this program. And then secondly, our sister entity, Send Relief, um, not to be confused with World Relief, uh, but our sister entity, uh, Send Relief, um, has been on the front lines of serving refugees both abroad and here, here in the United States. So, um, you know, maybe if you're sitting at home thinking, how can I help? How can I serve? I would, I would encourage you to reach out to Send Relief, to World Relief, to, to Beth, to one of these organizations that are involved and, and and see what needs are being met. Um, you know, you can there are maps online where you can see where refugees are being resettled, and maybe you live near one of those places um, where there's immediate needs of um, shelter and housing and transportation and uh, you know English English school and and all of that. So I would recommend um, you know reaching out to one of the organizations I listed and seeing how you can get involved. And then lastly, and uh, most importantly, is pray. Um, you know, I think sometimes we can view, you know, we work, 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 and then and then we pray. Um, but prayer, prayer deeply matters. Um, and as Christians, we're called to advocate um, through our prayer as well. Um, so I would encourage all of us to set aside special uh, times daily and weekly, individually and with our churches to be praying for vulnerable people around the world. Chelsea, that is a perfect setup for where I was going to go after one more question. So we are going to turn to prayer to close our conversation. Um, but I did have this question from um, uh, a couple of different questions came in and maybe I'll, I'll give this to you, Galen, to close us out. And this relates to the border. I mean, you mentioned that um, one of the uh, policy priorities that might form part of a package that could actually pass through the Congress in the current environment would be something addressing some of the challenges at the border. One thing I know that that, you, that is true is there's been some changes in, you know, there's been a very large number of apprehensions at the US-Mexico border, <clears throat> a number of apprehensions in the last year. But notably, a lot of these people are not trying to sneak into the United States. They're trying to look for the Border Patrol to request asylum professing some sort of a fear of persecution if they would be returned. Um, are, from your perspective, Galen, are there policy solutions to that challenge that would both you know, restore some order, but also sustain our country's legal and moral commitments to offering protection to those who flee persecution? Yes, I think the, there are. I think the first, the place to start is to ask, what is it that we're trying to accomplish at the border? And frankly, I think at the moment, neither Republicans nor Democrats in Congress have a clear idea of what, the, what they want to see at the border. Uh, but I, I look at uh, President Reagan, um, and his vision was uh, that we should be efficiently and legally um, processing and admitting the immigrants whose immigration is in the national interest. So if you think about it, like two circles, the all the immigrants that would like to come here and then all the immigrants that we would like to have come here and, and as a Venn diagram is a very large middle set there where the people both want to be here and it's in our interest to have them here for a whole host of reasons. Uh, and so, but right now we don't have a efficient legal system for admitting uh, many of these people. So that would be the first thing. If we fix that problem, then the, the remaining problem of what to do about people who are come, trying to uh, smuggle drugs or uh, what terrorists and people like that, then our Border Patrol will have a much easier job uh, not looking for needles and haystacks. Uh, so I think what we need to have a good legal system, then legal processing, modernize our ports of entry. Uh, we need uh, certainly enforcement, but we need humane enforcement at the border uh, for so, so that those who are coming to seek protection have the right to seek that and to make their case in in a in a in a in a way that doesn't uh, short shrift the due process. Uh, that's something that is been right now very difficult, in part because of um, the policy that we have dating back to the pandemic of turning back just about everybody under what's called the Title 42 authority. So because we say these people may have COVID, uh, we don't want them, period, and we just send them straight away back. That's one of the things, by the way, that is also um, in increasing the uh, border statistics 
because you have people who are being sent back without even fingering, figuring out who they are, and so then they try again, and so they make, same person may try three or four times, but they, they're counted as if there were four separate people. So if we can get, uh, uh, stop doing that, and, and then give the proper attention to the people, especially those that are seeking protection, uh, that would go a long way uh, toward uh, uh, reducing, not, not eliminating, but reducing the, the security vulnerabilities at the border. Thank you so much, Galen, and thank you, Hannah and Chelsea.